I are incredibly fortunate to be living at this time and this place in human history. If we were living in the 1300s in Europe, we probably would have been killed by the bubonic plague, which wiped out 50% of Europe's population in just a couple of years. If we were growing up in Boston in the 1670s, we would have seen one in five of the people we knew and loved die from smallpox, a devastating disease that in the 20th century alone killed over 300 million people, but fortunately has been eradicated due to a successful global vaccination campaign. And sadly, if we were simply born today, but on the other side of the world in sub-Saharan Africa, there's almost a one in four chance that we wouldn't leave to see, live to see age 15 because of our modern plagues that include HIV and malaria and tuberculosis. Today we're gonna to talk about a disease that hits closer to home and that very well could in our lifetimes cause major human mortality. And that disease is influenza. Every year we experience seasonal epidemics that infect millions of people and kill tens of thousands of people in the United States. It's caused by a virus that's continually evolving, which means you can get infected by flu many times in your life, and it also means we have to rethink our vaccine almost every single year. Occasionally, we get brand new strains of flu introduced into the human population from animals, often livestock. When this happens, and if that strain can spread easily from person to person, we're at risk for a very large global epidemic that can be quite deadly, and we call those pandemics. We actually had three pandemics in the 20th century, and we've already had one in the 21st century. As you can see from this graph, the first and the worst, the most notorious, was the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. It's estimated that it killed 100 million people in a matter of just a few months around the world. Later in the 20th century, we had the Asian flu pandemic and the Hong Kong flu pandemic. And then in 1977, we had something that looked like a pandemic, a new strain suddenly circulating the globe, but it turned out it was a strain that was spreading in the 50s that had just escaped a lab in China near the Russian border in 1977. So let's fast forward now to our current threats. In 1997, we became aware of a very deadly strain of avian flu, numbered H5N1, that is, is wreaking havoc in poultry farms around the world. And whenever it infects people, it's really deadly. Fortunately, it has not evolved the ability to spread from person to person. But if it does, we could be in for a pandemic even far worse than the 1918 flu. For that reason, the international public health community has been working for almost two decades to prepare for the next pandemic. Well, it turned out the next pandemic wasn't deadly avian flu out of China, but a milder swine flu out of Mexico, which you may remember, it was the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. And today, we have on our radar a couple of other new strains of flu that we're concerned about. There's H3N2 variant, which is causing outbreaks in the Midwest, particularly associated with farms and state fairs. And then there's another deadly avian flu, an H7N9, that's caused two outbreaks in China within the last 12 months. That's a century of flu. Now let's zoom in on a few seasons of flu. And let's take a close look at the 2006-2007 season. Very typical. Flu starts rising when kids are back in school. November, it's really climbing. We hit a little peak in December. Things die off a little bit over winter break, and then we get our major peak in February. The 2008-9 seasons were very similar. And then just when we expected flu to die down for the summer, as it does every summer, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic emerged out of Mexico, started spreading in the US and around the globe. We had an unusual April wave of transmission and then a very early, very large wave of fall transmission that peaked in October. It died down and then we didn't see very much flu at all that year during the typical flu months of January and February. After the H1N1 pandemic, flu has gotten back into its normal rhythm. We had a very typical season in 2010-11. Not much flu at all in 11-12. And then our last two seasons have looked pretty typical, except our peak has been a little bit earlier in December. So how do doctors and public health officials on the front line fight diseases like flu? Well, it really depends on the disease. For gastrointestinal diseases in the developing world, clean drinking water and sanitation is essential. For uh, vector-borne diseases, mosquito-borne diseases like dengue, West Nile virus, malaria, mosquito control measures, including bed nets, can be really important to save lives. For flu, we have vaccines, but as I mentioned, it's sort of hard for us sometimes to keep up with the evolving virus, and we have medications called antivirals, which if taken early enough, can reduce your symptoms and, and shorten your infectious period. And particularly important are the things we call non-pharmaceutical interventions. Those are things like washing your hands and in 
um, implementing social distancing interventions like closing schools so people simply don't come in contact with each other. Those can be really important in the early days of a pandemic long before we are able to develop and to deploy an effective vaccine. These measures save lives, but they don't answer the big questions for us. They don't tell us who is infected in the world today, who will be infected tomorrow, and how can we stop the spread of these diseases. And that's where people like me come in, and people like me turn to supermodels. And I don't mean the lovely Christy Turlington and Mark Vanderloo, but what I mean is just like meteorologists build big models of the atmosphere and the oceans in order to understand and predict the weather, we build big models of diseases and human movement and human behavior in order to understand and anticipate what's going to happen with disease outbreaks. And we use supercomputers for these. So what do we put into our models? Well, we put fundamental science into our models. And one of the most important uh, developments and advances in, in our area of infectious disease epidemiology in the last 20 years has been an increased understanding of and appreciation for the importance of social networks, human contact patterns, in determining the fate of an outbreak. Who is in your orbit that you could catch or spread disease to? The people in your household, the people in your classroom, the people who you're out on the sports field with or that you bump into in Starbucks? And who are in their orbits? And who are in their orbits? And we're all a part of this giant web of contacts that determines exactly how and how fast and where diseases are going to spread when they're introduced into our populations. So in order to understand diseases, we build models of networks at all different scales from the entire globe down to a single healthcare facility. We also model networks that represent different kinds of interactions from the casual encounter in an internet cafe in Montreal to high-risk needle sharing or sexual contacts in an, an at-risk population in urban Atlanta. And we even build network models for different species, including pride-living lions in the Serengeti. And from these models, we really are getting important insights into how diseases spread. We can answer questions like, who are going to be the super spreaders in the next pandemic? And are there epidemic bridges, people that are connecting two populations that would otherwise be isolated that are going to serve as important conduits when an outbreak occurs? We can answer questions like, why do children often get infected before adults in epidemics, particularly flu epidemics? And why do some epidemics spread in multiple waves, like the three waves that occurred during the 1918 pandemic, and others just in one large wave? And then very practical questions like, who should get the first vaccines when we don't have many on hand? And who are the best sentinels? That means, who should we monitor so that we know what's happening in an outbreak, who's infected, and how fast it's spreading? So with that kind of science under our belt, we can now address the big three questions. The first one is, where are diseases today? Where do we get this kind of graph that I showed you earlier showing how much flu activity there is in the US? Well, the CDC's primary surveillance system consists of thousands of doctor's offices around the country shown on this map that are reporting on a weekly basis how many cases of flu they see in their office. So in 2009, the state of Texas came to my group at UT and asked us if we'd help them to optimize and evaluate Texas's flu surveillance system. The question was, is the information they're getting from these doctors actually telling them what they want to know about deaths and hospitalizations due to flu throughout the state? So using computer models, we were able to determine that a carefully designed network of just 35 information providers, 35 doctors, could be far more informative and useful than the actual about 200 that were in the state surveillance system at the time. And to do this, we modeled not only the spread of disease, but the spread of information about the disease. And then we used high-performance computers, supercomputers at the Texas Advanced Computing Center here in Austin, along with sort of fancy optimization methods in order to systematically figure out what would be the very best combination of doctor's offices to be gathering information from so we can detect outbreaks as early as possible and monitor the outbreaks as accurately as possible. So this new method that we've developed can not only be used to improve surveillance for many different diseases, but it can also importantly be used to integrate traditional data like we get from doctors with next generation digital data from sources like Google and Facebook and Twitter. And in fact, Google is the one that actually pioneered the use of digital data in disease surveillance with something called Google Flu Trends. The scenario is you're sick, someone you know is sick, what do you do? You sit in front of your computer and you Google fever, sore throat, 
Tamiflu. And Google said, well, how many people on a daily basis are actually Googling for flu-related terms? And when they graphed that search activity, it beautifully mirrored the actual epidemiological activity. And you can see that in this graph. The, glu the Google curve is in blue, and the CDC's real epidemi epidemiological data is in orange. So this can be very useful, except there's a really important discrepancy. If you squint your eyes and you look at the spring of 2009, you'll see that Google is far higher than the actual epidemiological activity. And why is that? Well, H1N1 started spreading, CNN started talking about it, and everyone started Googling about it, even though very few people were actually sick with it. So this can be incredibly valuable, but it has to be interpreted cautiously. And we are right now working with the CDC and the Texas Department of State Health Services to help them figure out how to really effectively integrate this next generation data in order to improve early detection and surveillance for diseases. Moving on to question two, forecasting. Who will have flu tomorrow? What we would really like to know is when and where that next pandemic is going to emerge, how deadly it's going to be, how quickly it's going to sweep the globe. But we can hardly even tell you what flu is going to do next week, let alone next month. This is a huge challenge and a really important priority. And so in order to inspire the scientific community and the technological community to really put on their thinking caps, the CDC just announced a contest, a flu forecasting contest. Well, thanks to the October federal government shutdown, they announced the contest the Monday before Thanksgiving with our first forecasting su submission due the Monday after Thanksgiving. So our group at UT, along with our 18 competitors around the country, we will probably forever associate flu with turkey. So, what do we have to do? Well, we have to, as accurately and early as possible, forecast when is flu season going to start, when is it going to peak, how high is that peak going to be, when is the flu season going to end, and how much flu activity, how many infections are there going to be over the course of the season. And my group at UT is using several different statistical methods, a combination of traditional and next generation data, as well as our scientific understanding, the fact that flu is correlated with humidity and flu transmission mission is also influenced by the school calendar. And whatever the outcome, whoever wins at the end of the flu season, this effort will certainly have advanced our ability to forecast flu. The final question, how can we use our models to actually help stop the spread of disease and save lives? Here's an example. In 2009, during the early days of the H1N1 pandemic, we worked with the federal government to help them figure out how to effectively use the strategic national stockpile of antivirals to slow the spread of the disease before we were able to develop and deploy an effective vaccine. The challenge was we only had 80 million courses of drugs, and we have a population of over 300 million people to protect. So we, again, we used supercomputers, we used optimization methods to very rapidly search through hundreds of millions of possible distribution schedules to figure out which ones are likely to save the most lives. And then after we did the analysis, we built this visualization software that you see on the screen, which, shows, which we used to show our, our public health collaborators exactly what the model was doing and exactly what the results meant. And even though we didn't use this for our analysis, using this to communicate th with public health was extremely vital in allowing us to take the science and translate that into decision making in DC. This is an example of a supermodel that we've developed for public health agencies to help them prepare for the next big one. The user can run any kind of flu, pandemic flu scenario they want, spreading fast, spreading slow, very deadly, more mild, and then implement intervention strategies, vaccination campaigns, antiviral campaigns, school closures, public health announcements, and see how they may play out in these realistic scenarios. And we've developed two versions of the software. On the left, you see a picture of the software being run on a multi-panel display in the visualization lab on UT's campus. Public health groups can actually go in and run training exercises in this facility. And now on the right is the desktop version that anybody can use on their computer at any time. And this is helping public health officials to get important intuition about the spread of flu and how interventions might impact that, and also, again, to bring the best science, the best data to, to bear on their planning for future pandemics. 
Finally, we've developed a suite of tools that are meant to really help in real-time decision-making by public health. These are web-based tools. This first one helps the public health agency figure out how to use pharmacies to get drugs out to a large population. The second one helps them decide whether, where to set up vaccine pods in order to achieve equitable access to vaccines across the state. And this third one helps them to ensure that hospitals have the resources they need on hand in order to be able to treat the surge in patients that are likely to come into hospitals during the peak of a bad pandemic. No two diseases are the same, and no two outbreaks of a single disease are the same. But nonetheless, the kinds of concepts and methods that I've shared with you today, network modeling, optimization, integration of next-gen data, can really help us to understand, track, forecast, and control all sorts of diseases, and can be as important as good drugs and vaccines in our arsenals that we're using to save lives around the globe. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge the phenomenal team of public health officials, scientists, and engineers that have all collaborated on the projects I've presented today and the agencies that make this work possible. Thank you.